Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Konstantin Kamenev. I work at the Center for Science at Extreme Conditions in Edinburgh. That's the picture of our interdisciplinary center, which was formed in 2002. And although I'm a physicist by trade, my role was to my role is to to, to work in, in sort of an engineering area and uh, look after the development of um, high pressure equipment and high pressure cells uh, for the for the research that we do in Edinburgh. Uh, I'll give you a quick outline of my of my lecture. I'll sort of give you the definition of pressure and uh, explain the genetic types of uh, pressure cells. I'll talk a bit about mechanical properties of materials, um, about choosing the right material for the pressure cell. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the, the tools as, that we use as engineers, uh, and these are computer-aided design software that allows you to make drawings of the pressure cells and um, finite element analysis that we use to test uh, the, the pressure cell performance in, in the, on the computer before, before the parts are built. I'll give you a couple of examples of, the, of high pressure uh, designs, and these are for neutron and x-ray diffraction, for magnetic property measurement, and for, uh, I'll, I'll give a quick uh, um, slide about the large plastic deformations and gaskets, which are quite important if you do the if you do the <coughs> high pressure work. So I'll start by uh, defining the pressure. As you know, pressure is the force divided by area. And depending on, on um, how your area is defined, the same force to the same book in this uh, diagram can produce you higher or lower pressure. So this book would produce lower pressure compared to this one. And that actually, although everyone knows this definition, I'm sure, in this room, it actually is a nice perspective to look at uh, from the engineering point of view, because then if you are talking about designing a pressure cell for your experiment, it, it, the, the task fo falls into two parts. It's generating the force and defining the pressure area to which that force is applied. Uh, everyone understands that the higher the force and the smaller the area, the larger the pressure that can be, can be achieved. And in terms of generating pressures, you can... You can find uh, devices large and small. And so on a large scale, there are hydraulic presses, which can generate 1,000 tons and more. On a small scale, there are sort of screw-driven uh, or, or thread-driven uh, pressure cells that can generate much lower force. But because the surface area is the surface of a diamond culet, the pressures they generate are much, much greater. Uh, the devices for generating sort of static force, the common ones are, as I said, are post anvils where you have uniaxial force and there are two surfaces pushing against each other and the pressure, compressing pressure medium in between. Um, and others such as hydraulic pumps, gas compressors, and hydrothermal cells. The hydrothermal cells are rather exotic for not many of you might know about them, but these are ones that are commonly used in, in geosciences. This is where you can lock the volume um, of, of medium, say, you have a sample and water, and you, you lock it in the pressure cell, and then you heat it up. And because when you heat it up, water expands, uh, you create pressure inside, and these are called hydrothermal cells. They're useful for uh, studying conditions on samples uh, in deep earth. In terms of defining the surface area, uh, the classic example would be the uh, opposed anvil cells, which uh, can work up to several megabars. And this consists of two diamonds with a sample in between supported by a gasket. You can have uh, hybrid designs such as indenta cells. So this is an example of an indenta cell where you have a plug, this conical thing, with, uh, with an electrical feed through going out, which is pressing into uh, uh, an inner piece with the sample contained in this hole. And by, uh, by compressing and deforming that piece, you, you create the sample pressure. And actually, indenta cells were precursors of a diamond anvil cell. Before people started doing the experiments this way, they uh, used one diamond polished to a, a, a fine um, semicircle or, or a needle, pressing on a larger surface diamond, and therefore you could create quite a large um, force. So those were asymmetric designs, and they were also called indenta type cells. Uh, piston cylinder cells, which I mentioned, which is very common, uh, which are the ones that uh, Percy Bridgman uh, looked at extensively and, uh, and improved the seals greatly. And this can go routinely to sort of 3 GPA pressure. And what they consist of is, uh, in this case, it's a two-layered cylinder with a piston uh, and locked from the other end. And then the piston is driven by a pusher and locked in by a nut at the back, which uh, allows it to be released from the from, uh, from a, a press and be used on its own uh, with other equipment. 
And there are things like multi-anvil cells where the sample is compressed not between two anvils, but between, um, say, in this case, eight anvils truncated so that you can have an octahedra in the in between, and uh, you can have these gaps between the between the anvils to shine the beam on and do some useful experiments. Uh, since we're on piston cylinder cells, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick introduction to uh, how this works and what's important in their design. And this is a diagram which shows the stress distribution in a, in a cylinder under high pressure. So what you see is a cross section. So you're looking downwards along the axis of the cylinder. This is the cylinder itself. And this is pressure medium compressed inside the cylinder. And there are two types of stresses, uh, tensile and radial. And you can see both are very high at the, at the surface of the, of the bore. And then they decay quickly um, towards the edge of the, of, the, of the cylinder. And you can see the, the dependence of that stress from the distance, from the, from the edge of the bore. And you can see stresses are minimal at the bore. Uh, so maximum of the bore and decrease rapidly with R leaving most of the cylinder under, under low stress. And um, you can also see from this diagram that increase in wall thickness is no help because you might think that you know, the, the thicker the, the, the cylinder, the higher the pressure I can achieve. So in principle, if you have a very large cylinder with a small bore, you can go to much higher pressures. In fact, that's not true. The, the problem is that as you start creating higher pressures on the, on the surface of the cylinder, you take it to the plastic deformation limit, and the, 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 uh, the, the, then you start the sort of the chain reaction, and the, the bore starts expanding, and effectively breaks the cylinder out, and, and the cylinder bursts. So, independently of how thick is the cylinder, there is a limit on the on the bore, and the the, the larger the bore, the higher the the hoop stresses in it, and therefore, the the sooner it will fail under pressure. There's a useful uh, uh, ratio to remember, and this is the, the ratio of diameters between the inner, inner bore of the cylinder and the outer diameter of the cylinder, and it's one to three, and that allows you to achieve the maximum pressure for minimum dimensions. That means that um, you can take this um, cylinder to the pressure, which is equivalent to the yield strength, in other words, the strength at which the um, material goes into large plastic deformation, uh, mode uh, and achieve that pressure on the in the bore of the cylinder. You can't take it any higher because then, as I said, you, your, your cylinder would would burst. In the the first opposed anvil cell, as um, classically considered, was by uh, Percy Bridgman, and uh, this is the the diagram from his paper published in 1951. This is the resistance of called of 72 element elements, alloys, and compounds to 100,000 kg centimeters uh, squared. And um, he, was, he introduced the idea of the, of the gasket supporting the, um, the anvils and also the, the composite anvil design. And there are various opposed anvil designs that's been developed since then. And I just put a few slides together. I'll explain you what they are. So um, going from from this diagram, this is uh, a, a rather large pressure cell that we built for the for the neutron diffraction experiments, and it has two uh, opposed um, sapphire anvils with a sample in between. It has two panoramic large windows uh, through which you can shine the beam. It also has a membrane to drive the piston and change pressure at low temperature. You have this very small cell, which is um, the diagram shown here. It's about that that big again with sapphire anvils. Uh, um, made um, to do the inelastic neutron scattering. That's what we tried it for. Uh, we also have done some diamond anvil work, and these are the, the, the slides showing the, the electron microscopy, uh, so a electron photograph and, 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 and a card drawing of anvils built for electrical resistivity measurements. And this is an anvil that we used for lithium studies because lithium goes into the diamond, so we needed to coat the tip of the diamond with uh, tungsten to stop the stop lithium from penetrating. And these are just some several slides from you know, pressure cells and uh, opposed anvil devices that come from my group, and and, and, and we are not doing even a, a tiny fraction of of the experiments. And this is where so my thinking stalled when I was preparing this presentation because I thought, how do I fit all the 
experimental techniques into a 45 minute talk. And uh, uh, some seven years ago, we organized a school on the Isle of Skye, and Stefan Klotz gave two lectures, which were two, two one hour lectures on, on high pressure techniques. And I still had his slides from that, from, from that lecture. And there were like two sets of 60 pages of PDF slides. And I looked at them, and he's done an excellent job. He was very methodic, but, and he, 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 he mentioned all the key areas. But even then, it was quite dry, so he missed some. He didn't mention some areas like, um, for example, pressure medium, which is important in, 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 in high pressure techniques. And I thought if I compress those, those 120 slides into a 45 minute talk, you will walk away with just overloaded brains and not much to remember. And then I thought, well, if the problem is that there are so many high pressure techniques, that means that we can do practically everything under high pressure, all sorts of physical characterizations can be done at high pressure. And then I thought, well, maybe I should talk about things that cannot be done under pressure. And I had a couple of things at the back of my mind that I thought could not be done at high pressure. I Googled them, and people are doing them. So uh, I can conclude that, in principle, we're doing everything, all the, all the characterization, apart from maybe one um, that I'm not going to mention because uh, I'm working on it, uh, that, that can be done under pressure. The problem is the limitations and the limits, and often, you can do a measurement, but at a very low pressure. And I can give you a couple of, sort of extreme examples. And one of them would be if you want, for example, to do um, inelastic scattering and, um, on a synchrotron. So you're doing a resonance studies. That means sending a beam of low energy, soft, soft beam, as, as, it, as it's called, at a sample, and make it interact with the sample and then measure it in the spectrum. And people can even do uh, magnetic studies, although you know, synchrotron beam is not... Uh, doesn't have magnetic properties of a neutron beam. Uh, the problem is that soft, soft X-rays interact very strongly with the matter. So if you have a pressure cell in between your sample and the beam, then the beam will be absorbed by the, by the pressure cell. So that means you can, oh, the only way to do it would be to make, the, make that volume through which the beam goes smaller. So imagine it's a piston cylinder cell, in which case the, the cylinder will have, have a very thin wall thickness and therefore you will be limited in terms of pressure. So you will do the experiment, but you will do it at a very low pressure. Uh, and another example, sort of if we had at the, since we're on synchrotron uh, studies, would be the, the greatest pressures that people can say. If you, if you ask yourself a question, what is the, if I can achieve the highest possible pressure, what kind of measurements will I be able to do on your sample, which is a very technique-related question. And the highest static pressures that people can do would be several hundred Megabars, and this is the technique recently pioneered by uh, Natalia Dubravinska and Leonid Dubravinsky from Bayreuth, who will be at this conference. And what they're doing, they're putting on top of the diamond, they're putting, I think they call it black carbon, uh, small spheres of, 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 of material, which is not as strong as diamond, but it's, uh, it's very tough. And it, the surface area of that small sphere is so small that stresses don't really build up in it to the extent that it collapses. But the sample is tiny, tiny. It's, it's, it's a matter of microns. And therefore, the only study you can do is against synchrotron. The light won't be able, if you want to do a Raman study, the hole in the gasket is so small that you won't be able to get any signal out of the pressure cell. But the synchrotron is so bright, they can penetrate through the, through the material and onto that small sample. And that's the study you can do. And practically the only study you can do at the very high possible, highest possible pressures. Um, on the dynamic uh, side of things, again, we're talking about compression, fast compression experiments. These are either done at shock facilities like uh, laser uh, NIF facility, which is national ignition facility in the States, where the, practically the pressure cell is evaporated with a strong laser beam. And then you have a split second to measure the signal coming out of the cell at this massive pressures. And again, you can only do um, synchrotron work on that and, and get the diffraction pattern out because hard X-rays penetrate through the, through the cell, and they're very fast and they're very strong in terms of the data acquisition. You can, you can capture the pattern and do a time-resolved time diffraction. So, um, in, in principle, as I said, we, we can do uh, anything. It's, it's just a matter of limitation imposed by the, by, the, by the experiment and the pressure cell, and often by the sample. And from my own experience, it, the, the way you do experiments is very sample-specific. If you want to so if I, I'll give you an example of, say, doing a magnetic measurement, you can have, if you want to measure magnetic susceptibility of a sample, you can have a sample which is very magnetic, in which case you can detect the signal from a very small sample in a, in a, in a diamond anvil cell, 
or the sample can be not magnetic at all, and therefore you need a lot of it, and probably you'll end up doing a piston cylinder type experiment. You will have very low pressure, but at least you will see the sample and will be able to measure, the, measure its magnetic susceptibility. So I thought uh, I'd rather spend the rest of the time telling you how to make pressure cells or modify pressure cells, because as experimental scientists we work in high pressure, we all have to do that um, during our careers. And this is because um, we simply can't get the pressure cells that we need to suit the samples that we want to study. And I listed a couple of um, reasons as to why we need to build pressure cells or adapt them to our experiments. You, you have particular sample requirements, so you have solid, liquid, or gas sample to study. It can be weakly, strongly scattering, have weak or strong magnetic response, and so on. Or you need to fit the pressure cell into the rest of the sample environment. We, we rarely use the pressure cells on their own. We often put them in cryostats, we heat them with a the laser beam, or, or use resistive heaters, so or it goes inside a cryo instrument, or it needs to go on a neutron or, or synchrotron beam line. And therefore, this pressure cell needs to work with the, with the detectors and, uh, and incident beam that is there. And there's a limited com uh, commercial availability of pressure cells. If you look at what is on offer by EasyLab and Batsa, they have generic types which are commonly used by people. But again, if you want to do something unique, if you want to be ahead of the game and, and beat your competition, then you will, you will need to build your own pressure cell or modify the existing pressure cell. And if you, if you think about the design process from sort of the starting stages, you, you first decide on the pressure limit or sample volume that you require for your experiment. That will define the type of a pressure cell. Again, if you need to go to high pressure limit, then you need a pressure, uh, an opposed anvil device. If the sample volume is important, then it will need to be a lower pressure limit, but um, and, and probably a piston cylinder type device. You select the material of the cell uh, to suit the experimental requirements, draw the design of the cell and its components, test your design using um, computer tools, and then hand your drawings to the workshop for manufacturing. In terms of the material selection, the, some key properties are you need to think about thermal, or thermal expansion, thermal conductivity experiments, electrical resistivity, magnetic properties, optical, if you need transparency, chemical, the activity with the sample, resistance to corrosion. So all these things uh, matter when you choose the material for the, either gasket or, or, the, or the piston cylinder cell. But most important properties are mechanical because they define the pressure limit to which you can go. And the key mechanical properties are mainly strength, which, is the, which can be tensile, which is the, the, the stress when you try to pull on the material, or compressive, it's when you're trying to compress it. And both are important in pressure cell designs. And that's a stress applied to a part uh, at, at the point where it fails. Elastic modulus, which tells you what deformation you get for, for a given force, which is stress to strain ratio, the response of material to stress in the elastic deformation regime. You have toughness, which is important. It's the resistance to fracture of a material when it's stressed. You have stiffness as well, which is force to deflection ratio. It's resistance of an elastic body to deflection of deformation. Hardness, most people know it's important. It's, it's the resistance to elements. It's the resistance to indentation, scratching, and we know diamond is very hard in that respect. Fatigue resistance, that's the number of stress cycles before failure. That mainly applies to, um, to piston cylinder cells because stress is built up in them. And also to multi-anvil devices, when you use those truncated cubes, you have stress remaining in them and building up, and then they suddenly explode, and uh, sometimes in your hands. So you need to be careful with them. And often people keep journals of, of using piston cylinder cells and, and multi-anvil devices. The common sort of stress strain diagram, you have several. So this is stress versus strain. Strain, if you like, it's the, it's the, it's the deformation, and stress is the response of the material. So in this case, it's a very strongly responding material. It's a hard material, uh, which, uh, so you have the elastic deformation, uh, then, and then at some point it becomes plastically deformed, and then it ruptures at point three. And there's a necking region, which is area five, that's just before the rupture. That's when, if you're doing a pooling experiment on a dumbbell shape uh, sample of the material to establish its stress strength, then that's where the necking starts. A strength, uh, that's another view of the same diagram. Uh, that's for, the, for metals. For ceramics, it looks slightly different. Ceramics uh, normally don't have any plastic deformation. They just fail uh, brittily. 
a useful diagram that you can find in most materials books is the Jans modulus for different materials. And it's a Jans modulus versus strength diagram. So you, on this axis, you have Jans modulus. And on this uh, axis, you have strength. And you can see at the low end of this, of this diagram, you have soft materials like silicon, cork, polymer forms, uh, elastomer, so very soft materials. And at this end, you have tungsten carbide, diamond, silicon carbide, and there are materials in between, like ceramics, porous ceramics, and they're grouped in. So engineering composites are here. These are woods, um, and metals are here, uh, and alloys um, as well. So that's very useful when you define, uh, when you decide on the properties of materials. Uh, metals. The common metals uh, include margin steel. This is iron-based alloys. Uh, based um, based so, uh, alloys based on iron. Iron, they're very no, uh, good for um, uh, easy to process properties, superior strength and toughness without losing malleability. They resist corro uh, corrosion reasonably well and crack propagation. Um, these are some properties um, of the margin steel. The ultimate tensile strength is this number for these two steels. That I mentioned here. I mean, it might not mean much to you, but if you remember what I said about the the, the limitation on the piston on the cylinder design, that you can achieve the the maximum pressure achievable on the bore of the of the cylinder is equivalent to the ultimate strength or near the ultimate strength of the material. So this is 2.2 GPA. So effectively, if you build the piston, if you build the cylinder of this material, you will be able to achieve the maximum of 2.2 GPA, and of this steel, it would be 1.9 GPA. So it's kind of easy to uh, quickly get from the information uh, spec sheet um, the, uh, the maximum strength that you can get and the maximum pressure that you can achieve with it. Uh, this is the yield strength of the burlesque steel, which is mentioned here. There are super alloys, which are not iron-based, but nickel and cobalt mainly based. Uh, they have um, cubic crystal structure. They're excellent mechanical strength. They're slightly weaker than... Uh, uh, than the margin steels, but uh, they're normally less magnetic, like this example of chrome nickel aluminium. Um, they're very dependent on the, on the heat treatment regime, but they're useful in construction of pressure cells. Beryllium copper is even weaker, but it's even better in terms of magnetic properties because it doesn't have much of a magnetic impurities in, the, in it, and so it's commonly used for building pressure cells for magnetic applications, and also making gaskets for diamond tendril cells used for uh, magnetic measurements because it has very low magnetic susceptibility. It has a yield strength of 1.6 GPA. So if you had to build a, a pressure cell, a piston cylinder pressure cell from this material, that's the highest pressure that you hope to achieve in it. Then there come ceramics. Uh, they're strong electrically and thermally uh, resistant, resistant to high temperature, but very brittle. Uh, so common ones are zirconia, alumina, tungsten carbide uh, with very high strength, and synthetic diamond with a, with a double strength of, of tungsten carbide. The problem with them is that you can't really pull on them. And therefore, uh, if you look at the uh, complete two diagrams, this is uh, material tensile strength, and this is compressive strength for materials. And as you can see, so there's beryllium copper, zirconia, tungsten carbide, and so on. The, uh, the same materials in, uh, in, in, compress in compression, they, the metals are basically just as strong in tensile as in compression. But um, then you have very strong, strong materials and this, this section here, these are fibers, uh, modern composites like xylon, um, carbon, um, and they're not obviously very good in compression, um, but in tension they're very good for, for applications, and you often require them for non-metallic, non-magnetic applications. But as you can see, the xylon matches the, so the compressive, the, the, the tensile strength of, of composites matches the compressive strength of tungsten carbide, which is, which is very good. Where do you find the properties of materials? Well, you can look up in reference books. Uh, you can look at manufacturers' websites and material property databases, and MATWEB is one of them, and most universities have access to it. Uh, on the tools that, that engineers use to make pressure cells, so one of the most important ones is the computer-aided design that allows you to create 3D shapes of parts and put them in assemblies and do cross-sections and put those cross-sections into into technical drawings for the workshop, and sometimes you can convert those shapes into machining codes that you can just transfer it to the, to the lathe and it will machine you the shape of the part that you want. 
Uh, and this is an example of the, uh, of the pressure cell that we built for PPMS for the physical property measurement system for quantum design. It's a diamond anvil cell. Um, and this is it in the cross section. This is the, um, the 3D rendered diagram with a, with a cross section. As you can see, it's, it's, it, you can make very clear pictures and explain people what the design is. You can also see that things are not interfering, parts are not interfering with each other and that they fit well. And uh, yeah, these are the parts made made from these drawings. Um, it also allows you to, I think this, this video still doesn't work. No, but it also allows you to see uh, parts in motion. So in this diagram, this is um, a rotator that we built for a magnet and this is the bore of the magnet and this is a pressure cell mounted on it. So when you run the animation, you can see that the pressure cell is turning on the support and that it doesn't run into the, into the wall of the, of the cryomagnet. Uh, most common pack packages include Solid Edge, Solid Works, AutoCAD, and as I said, most universities have access to these licenses uh, through the package deals, and you might be able to find one and don't have to pay for it. Finite element analysis is another package which is a bit uh, more difficult to use. Uh, you need to know the basics of, the, of it. But basically, it's, it's a method that allows you to do to break continuous structure into discrete structure and look at the reaction of those little elements of your part to the stresses that you apply to, to dislocations or deformations. And it's used to uh, calculate the stress distribution, deformation and the load, temperature gradients and magnetic field distributions. This is the, so the most useful applications from the high pressure point of view. Um, it's often used in car manufacture. You can see the the large deformation during a car crash, been modeled in, in FA and, and in, the, in assessing the bone, uh, bone structure and bone, bone toughness. Uh, the basic steps of the process is you basically create a part that you want to model. Uh, you simplify the model using the, using the symmetry. If it's a symmetric part, you don't have to make the whole part. You can make half of it if it's plain symmetric or, or 2D cross section if it's axis symmetric. Uh, you assign properties of a particular material, which is basically Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. Uh, break down the whole structure into elements. Software does it from you. It's called meshing process. So that, can, that transfers that part into this meshed mode where it's broken into elements. And the software, again, adjusts the mesh according to the stress concentration. And it allows you to look at, the, at, at places where stress concentrates more by creating more elements there. And then you apply loads, you tell it where the, where the force acts is in this uh, gear part and boundary conditions, so the part is supported. And then it solves for displacements and calculates you the, the, the parameters that you need, which are mainly stresses and deformations. And that is done during the post-process and it finds reaction forces, stresses and deformations. And it can be used to model um, stress distribution, deformation and the load, temperature gradients, magnetic field distribution, fluid dynamics, um, in flow systems, and the major packages include ANSYS, Abacus, and Nastron. This is what this is engineering sort of industry standard software. Um, then you also need for making pressure cells, you need some sophisticated specialized machines like diamond polishing machine, laser cutting if you want to cut uh, holes in, in tough gaskets. Uh, this is a gun drilling machine that allows you to drill very long bores, parallel bores of, uh, for piston cylinder cells. And I'll give you a couple of examples how this can be used and how this is useful. This is one example of a system called Uranium Germanium II, which has some exotic superconductivity at high pressure where superconductivity coexists with ferromagnetism. And that's the phase diagram of it. So if you want to study this, this region, it only exists at high pressure, it's sort of between one and one and a half GPA at low temperatures. And so we wanted to do the uh, inelastic neutron scattering on this sample. And, um, the way we, we approached it was we had basically the single crystal grown. We knew the dimensions of it and we knew that it's, uh, it's a five millimeter diameter crystal. And so we built the pressure cell around it. We knew that it, it needs to go to 1.5, 1.6 GPA or maximum two GPA. Um, we knew the size of the sample and so we built the, this, this uh, structure of the cell around it. We, we built it as a two layered um, cylinder as you can see, so the red area is where the sample sits and the pressure medium is. And then you have two cylinders around it. One is made from chrome nickel aluminum, which has the yield strength of 2.1 GPA. So it's exceeding the 2 GPA 
uh, pressure limit that you want to achieve, and the outside is made from beryllium copper, which is a non-magnetic alloy with a 1.4 uh, yield strength. And the inner, inner cylinder is pressed into the outer cylinder, so there's a stress on the interface which helps you to achieve higher pressure. <coughs> And then what we did, we applied, we selected the area inside the, in, inside the bore, and we applied the, the 2 GPA pressure to it. And we looked at the stress distribution. And what we were interested in is that in these two cylinders, the maximum pressure, which is indicated, or maximum stress, which is indicated by this color, does not exceed the yield strength of the material, so it will still be in the elastic deformation mode. And as you can see, the inner bore goes to 2.09, which is just short of 2.1, uh, GPA of maximum yield strength for chrome nickel aluminum, and this uh, the outer bore goes to 1.3, which is the uh, near the limit of uh, uh, copper beryllium uh, material. And so you can you can effectively by doing this you can make sure that you have the minimum amount of material. If we uh, in, in the beam, because the, the inelastic neutron scattering requires a large sample volume and a low absorption from the pressure cell, because it's ten times um, uh, less efficient than the, than the diffraction, neutron diffraction experiments. And so uh, if we, for example, had the situation where the stress would have been higher somewhere than the yield strength, we would have to increase the, the thickness of the wall and that would have consequences for the amount of material in the beam. Uh, another example I wanted to show you is the uh, diamond tunnel cell that we built for low temperature experiments uh, for a low temperature diffraction. And the, the challenge is there with the dimensions, the pressure cell should be miniaturized to reduce its thermal loss. We build it for the open air system, so this is for cryostream systems, in which the cell sits not inside a closed, enclosed cryostat, but under the beam of, uh, of flowing gas, nitrogen or helium. Um, geometry, it should comply with the restriction imposed by the cryogenic equipment, which is gas flow rate and geometry. And also material selection was important not only mechanical properties, but also thermal properties uh, of, of the material used in the construction of the cell. And we built a, a, a miniature metal busset cell. This is a diagram showing a, a third of the cell. So you can see the, 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 the support vein for the diamond. Diamond sits here with the Bell Almax diamond. And uh, you apply the pressure to, uh, pressure to it, and then you can see what stresses are generated, so you can minimize the the, the, the design, and that's the, that's the pressure cell here. It, it's quite small, it's less than so 9 millimeter in the, uh, 10 millimeter in diameter, or 11 millimeter in diameter circle, uh, driven by three screws with a sample sitting on a diamond, uh, supported by a gasket. And I think this diagram works, and again, that's uh, it's another useful thing about um, uh, CAD software that allows you to create animations which show, for example, the sequence of assembly in the, the pressure cell if you want to create like a user manual for people or show it in demonstrations. So uh, that's how the cell is assembled and then you drive it with, uh, with three screws and a gearbox that engages into them. And these are parts of the pressure cell uh, physically built. Um, this is the, these are the data collected from it with single crystal sodium chloride um, and the diamond spots are tungsten uh, gasket, faint lines, and the diamond bright, bright spots here. This is it next to the standard classic metal busted cell that you can buy from Batsa or from, um, from EasyLab. Uh, and you can see the, so it's about um, six times lighter and, and, and third, of a, third of a size. It's also made from beryllium copper, which is better in terms of uh, thermal properties compared to the, to the steel. As the cell mounted on a on an X-ray machine, so you have an X-ray source that uh, shines the beam onto the uh, sample there, and then you have uh, a detector here. The, the 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 green stuff is a camera, and then you have a cry stream. So basically, the stream of gas comes out and cools down the cell. And what we found is that when we tested it, is that whatever is in the in the stream of gas, it stays uh, frost-free, and you can actually do the measurement. Uh, quite efficiently without getting the contamination from ice. But areas of the cell which are outside the stream, as you can see here, uh, are, are started to, to, to be covered with ice. So we needed to, to do uh, a, a slightly better job on it. And this, uh, the, the, again, the results of the experiment uh, taken at different temperatures. So you can see um, 
And that when the cell sits for a couple of hours at minus 170 degrees C, which is 100 Kelvin, you start seeing more ice, uh, ice appearing in the pattern. So we've, uh, our next design was built on the principle which was first used by uh, Stan Tozer in the States for making very small plastic pressure cells. And it's based on the turnbuckle uh, principle, which is, uh, all, all of you have seen this device, it basically works by, it works for tension in cables. You attach two ends of a cable um, to, the, to this device and then you rotate the handle and because you have left hand thread here and right hand thread here, it moves the ends towards each other and tensions the cable. You could use the same principle uh, and that's what Stan did by compressing the material in between this, these two handles, if you like. And so that's exactly how it works. So you have two Berlin Almax diamonds here, and two, uh, supported by two end nuts, and they go into a body of, of a pressure cell. And you can see it's quite minimalistic. So it's six millimeters here by nine millimeters across, um, and it's much smaller than the previous pressure cell that I showed you. And again, we did the uh, FEA, so this is 25 GPA pressure applied to the culet of the diamond, and we were mostly interested, uh, diamond is safe in this cell, so it never fails, because the pressure never exceeds uh, any critical values, but the, the end nuts uh, can deform and can experience high stress. And this is what we were worried about, but when we looked at it, it's, uh, the, the maximum stress in the steel was 2 GPA at this point, which uh, for, for some, some alloys is fine, so it's, it's, it's doable. And actually, the deformation is, is amplified here, so it's, um, <coughs> again, I suspect this will not work, no. But you can do an animation of the same uh, simulation and see how stresses propagate with, with increasing load. Um, this one might work. Uh, this, again, an assembly diagram for the cell. Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, but basically, it's quite simple. It has two diamonds that sit in the end nuts, and then you, uh, you put this and this end in the into the body and gasket supports the sample. <laughs> That's the picture of that cell uh, with key dimensions. You can, we, we, we made some holes in the body so you can see the alignment of the diamond. Uh, you can apply pressure by using either a press or a special uh, gearbox that we built. And um, that's how good the alignment is of the diamonds. You, you don't have many alignment mechanisms so you can't really adjust the, the position of the diamonds. You can only do it through good machining and precision machining and uh, achieve quite a good um, alignment at pressure experiments. And that's the same cryo stream system with the pressure cell mounted, fully covered by the flow of gas now. And as you can see, this is a temperature uh, versus time diagram. So uh, this is the blue line is the temperature measured on the, on the cryo stream itself, on the cryogenic system. And the red one is the one measured by a, a thermocouple attached to the to the pressure cell. You can see if you cool it very fast in 30 minutes between room temperature and 100 Kelvin, uh, the temperature of the cell lags behind slightly and then sort of catches up when the temperature stops. And at, in about 40 minutes, it, uh, the temperature difference is about 24 Kelvin. Uh, it, it's probably better if you remove the thermocouple, which provides an extra thermal link to the outside environment. So it probably the temperature is better. And there's a variation of this cell that we built for magnetic measurements, and that's uh, as even a smaller pressure cell. Uh, it doesn't have large windows for the X-rays because you don't need them for the, um, for the, uh, for the magnetometry work. Um, so it uses standard diamonds with a cylindrical hole behind them. And as you can see, it's, it's a smaller cell, seven millimeters. Uh, we now made it smaller <coughs> than six for uh, helium-3 inserts into, into the squid for sub kelvin temperature measurements. Uh, and these are the this is it mounted in a standard straw of the squid. So those of you who, who are familiar with the squid work, with the magnetometer work, would recognize that. And finally, I wanted to show you that, and again, I'm not sure if this will work. No. Uh, but uh, the, what I showed you previously, we were interested about the, when we did the FEA, we were interested in taking the material to the edge of its elastic limit. But also you can use FEA to measure large plastic deformations, which is important when you do a post anvil work. The, the sample is often supported of, well, normally supported by a gasket. Gasket is quite thin, uh, but if you're interested in, in modeling the strength of the anvils, um, like we did in this case, or you want to optimize the thickness of the gasket, you would need to take it to much higher pressures than its elastic limit. And in this case, what, uh, what this diagram shows is that uh, some of you who do the 
uh, neutron diffraction experiments with the Paris Edinburgh cell. This is a, a, a um, two toroidal uh, pressure cell. So you have two toroids with uh, two ring gaskets, and the sample is sitting here in this quarter circle. This is a quarter section of the cell. And the, the shape of the anvil is this. So you have the space for the sample, and then space for the first toroid, and space for the second toroid. The idea of toroids uh, is to stop the, stop the gasket from expanding. <coughs> Uh, and flowing easily, so it's, it's like uh, increasing friction of the gasket on the on the anvil, so that it doesn't flow that readily. And in this experiment, we've, we've achieved quite large deformation. As you can see, if the video worked, uh, you could see the deformation and the gasket flowing out. And it actually tells you how stresses build up in the anvil and how you can uh, improve the pressure limit. So these are um, the large plastic deformation experiments that you can do. And finally, I have some uh, a list of of books and, and journals that uh, you might want to use as references. This is in high pressure cells, the high pressure cell journals, and then engineering textbooks with some key information on um, material properties. And there are some references to the, to the material properties website and also card packages and FAA packages that you can find. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. That, that was on the a Nature paper on the hardest metal compressibility. Yeah. It was the same method. Yeah, yeah, it was the same method. Yeah, yeah. But uh, several, 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 several hundred GPA is the way they prefer to talk about it because it's really difficult. There are no scale. I mean, Stefan might talk about this because he talks. Uh, he will give a talk on pressure scales, but it's difficult to even know what the pressure is at this, at this high pressures. But people are now talking about moving to terapascal range, which is quite inspiring. What, what cells? Alumina cell, if we are using alumina. Alumina. If the, if the cell is made from alumina. Yeah. Well, you can, you can use any, any pressure medium. So often people use solid pressure medium with a bit of liquid to make it more hydrostatic. Uh, but you can use it with liquids. Depends on what experiments. I don't think alumina gives any constraint on the pressure medium that you can use. Uh, well, I, this, the alumina cell that comes to my mind is Mach 1 cell, which is used for neutrons, which has uh, uh, the, the, the area immediately around the sample is, uh, is of, uh, of alumina. And that e, they, they use uh, sodium chloride as a pressure medium. I don't think they can use liquids. But you can, you can build capsules. If you, if you Teflon capsule and contain the sample in Teflon capsule. So the pressure cell will think that the pre pressure medium is solid because it's, it's soft plastic. But inside you can, have, um, you can have liquid medium. The problem is that if you then put it in the beam, you need to be sh sure that the, the, the capsule doesn't absorb the beam because most polymers do. Actual pressure medium is, is, a, is a big subject. Uh, one of the most interesting experiments in, in, in sort of theoretical terms is uh, to do is the ones where the ambient pressure technique relies on doing, pressure, uh, doing measurement in vacuum. So these are measurements like, for example, heat, heat capacity. Right? If you do heat capacity, you have a sample mounted on the platform. The platform is suspended on four small wires in vacuum. And underneath that platform, you would have a small resistive heater and, and a thermometer. And the way the measurement goes, you send a small pulse of heat to the sample, then you switch that pulse off, and you measure how quickly the heat dissipates in the sample. If you do this experiment in a pressure cell, then the current problem is that you have pressure medium inside, and so the, the, the heat would leak quickly through the pressure medium. Then you start thinking, okay, well, we, I can cheat the nature and, and put pressure medium which is very uh, not heat conductive, so it will mimic diamond. So you think about what are the not heat conductive media, and these are ceramics, which are used on, say, shuttles to, to make them heat resistant. But, okay, you can crumble it, or you can make it a powder, but then it's not very hydrostatic at all. And secondly, it has high heat capacity, so it will, it will not transmit the heat, but it will soak the heat on the interface between the sample. But still people manage to do these experiments. It's just that they can't do it in proper units. 
and that's the limitation for many high pressure techniques that you can't get the results in, in the units of that technique at ambient pressure, you have to get arbitrary units. Gasket, sorry. Um, well, using very small gasket. yeah, it depends. Sometimes we need big holes in the gasket. So when, when we do nutrient diffraction experiments or nutrient scattering experiments, we drill them mechanically. So you need a hole of a one millimeter or two millimeters in diameter. So the best way to do it is to do it by manual, by, by mechanical drilling. Then the common technique, sort of, for smaller gaskets is to do EDM, so electro, electric erosion. So you put your gasket in a bath of paraffin oil and then just drill with electrical discharge. Then if you do even smaller gaskets and the quality of the edge is important, then you do laser drilling and then you, you, you focus a very small beam of, of, of laser on the surface and, and move the gasket in a circular way to cut the hole. Uh, the problem is that the, then you end up with a rough edge of molten metal. For some, for some metals, it's the only way to do it because they can't be drilled by any other means like rhenium. They're, they're very hard. Um, but then you end up with a rough surface and that roughness can cause the collapse of the gasket because it would work as wedges when the pressure pushes from inside it tries to open those cracks up and, and the gasket fails. So there's no single answer to that. But laser drilling gives you the smallest, smallest possible damage. Yeah. 